pleasure to uh, welcome our second philosopher in this series, um, Ernst Wolf. I had the pleasure of teaching his older brother, I think it was, yes. It still is, I hope. <laughs> you haven't caught up. Um, Heinrich, um, who spent his first three years as one of our students before moving on to Cape Town, where he has graduated and working. Um, but Ernst is here with us this evening, and he is a professor of philosophy and works in the social and political, in social and political philosophy, phenomenological hum hermeneutics, and the philosophy of technology. After his postgraduate studies in Johannesburg and Paris, he started teaching at the University of Pretoria, where we find ourselves, since 2005. From 2007 to 2011, he was a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, that at Essen, Germany. His most in public, important publications are, and this is where you're going to have to excuse me, De l'Ethique à la Justice, by Springer in 2007, Political Responsibility for a Globalized World, which I believe is a transcript of the same, is it? That right? or what is the uh, no, it's another title. Another title, uh, transcript <coughs> is probably the publisher, 2011, and he's co-editor with O. Kozlarek and Jorn Rusen, Shaping a Humane World, transcript 2012. And with that, we look forward to hearing you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, generous introduction. I would like to start by thanking uh, uh, the sponsor of uh, this uh, lecture series. Uh, I would like to thank also the Department of Architecture for forwarding me this uh, opportunity and for those who spent quite some time and long uh, exchanges of emails with me to organize it. Thank you very much. I've been hoping for an opportunity to think about architecture for quite some time. As it happens, I have a, uh, a family with uh, about six or seven architects in them, and I very often spend time with people thinking about the practice of architecture, but I haven't had the opportunity up to now to uh, really think about it and form some of my own opinions about that. So I thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, discipline myself and put something on paper. In fact, um, so much that I um, appreciate this uh, opportunity that it became so fruitful that I have more than I can present here tonight. So what you have here is about half of the things that I would have liked to present to you and uh, I will refer to the, uh, to the other half only right at the end of, uh, of this lecture. Let me start with what uh, Christoph Heinz uh, last week in a lecture called Expectation Management. I shall not speak for philosophy. Philosophy is not one thing, and I do not claim to be able to speak for all its divergent forms. It's common knowledge that you have European philosophy, African philosophy, Chinese and Indian philosophy, and within each of these disciplines, you get a sub-discipline, or within each tradition, sub-disciplines, philosophy of science, political philosophy, philosophy of technology, cultural philosophy, and so on and so forth. And from each of these different perspectives, you could engage in a quite interesting, legitimate way with uh, architecture. I speak only from a province very roughly mapped out by the overlapping of phenomenology, hermeneutics, and social theory. I shall use the term social theory again in this uh, presentation. I understand under social theory an interdisciplinary endeavor in which philosophy and the sociology are uh, perhaps the two major role players. Then I would also like to say that I speak even from this very restricted and contingent point of view about another discipline and another set of practices, namely architecture, while anticipating the indispensable dialogue, discussion, debate, and correction that should come from you, the practitioners and theoreticians of architecture, as we try to reflect together about the world in which we live. This being the case, I present this paper as a possible framework for one among many possible dialogues between 
architecture and philosophy. Let me start by showing you the outline of my presentation. Uh, first, I will give you a short working definition of architecture and discuss that. Then I shall frame the question that will guide me through this uh, presentation in terms of the opposition generalities and singularities. In the most important part of the essay or of the presentation, I shall give you something like a simplified uh, social phenomenology of human-human and human-architect relations. And on the basis of that, I shall focus in or zoom into uh, one specific kind of human uh, artifact relation, and that's the relation with uh, buildings. Okay, so let us start with a working definition. I define architecture as the practices of intervening in the ongoing processes of human habitation. Now let me say um, very clearly from the outset that I do not intend this to be the immutable transhistoric essence of architecture, but a working definition or perhaps a workable definition for which the subsequent exposition should indicate both the plausibility and the clarifying potential. Then I also need to say that I'm thinking here of the practices of architecture from the restricted contemporary historical condition which specifies these practices with respect to the specialist profession, the fact that uh, we are thinking about practitioners who get access to that profession through university training, we are thinking about practices that are overseen by a professional council, and uh, we are thinking of uh, practices that are subject to laws issued by the mechanisms of the uh, parliamentary democratic state. Okay, so I'm not thinking about architecture over all centuries and eras and cultures. But let me uh, now run through the terms of this definition in order to make clear what I shall be speaking about. Okay, there are my qualifications. Let me focus first of all on the phrases practices of intervening and processes of habitation. My approach to architecture is a socio-theoretical one and more particularly an action theoretical one. Architecture will be understood as a form of social interaction and let it be stated from the beginning that the two action groups that are involved in these two actions in my definition are coordinated in such a way that the primary role is considered to be that of other people as they continue with their habitation. Architects only intervene in this ongoing process according to the description that I shall uh, provide. Now starting with the second half then of the definition, um, I would like to say just something quickly about human habitation. Habitation is a general characteristic of uh, human life. It's not merely a part or an episode of human life. It is not only what one does at the address where you live. It is a general form of individual and social everyday existence, although it cannot be simply taken for granted as a, as a given. So you can see here in my, oh, sorry, wrong button. Uh, there is an example of somebody arranging a, a cubicle in a way to personalize it. I shall come back to numerous other examples of this kind. Uh, you can think of uh, people living under conditions in which their ability to uh, to dwell, to inhabit the world has been disturbed very severely, I think, of uh, refugees. But even here, if you look at that uh, picture on the right hand, you see that woman sitting there on uh, blankets that she packed out in order to protect her garment from the soil. And look at that person there protecting himself against uh, the sun with a blanket and so on. It is very difficult for a human being to stop inhabiting the world, even though in that uh, situation, these are Tamil refugees in Sri Lanka, they are under severe strain, as can be uh, seen obviously from the picture. So for current purposes, I shall simply posit that habitation, in this sense, is a crucial component of human well-being. In fact, that the wish for a good quality of inhabitation is part of the human aspiration to live well with and for others 
even in just institutions. As such, the effort to enable one or to help others to inhabit their part of the world well is an ethical project. I shall refer to this again just at the end of the conclusion, but this uh, needs to be developed uh, somewhere else. Okay. Previously, as in the uh, summary of my presentation, I used the expression uh, art of intervening instead of practices of intervening. Now, the term art would still be appropriate here if um, one understands by art something like a skillful, knowledgeable arrangement of means by which, in this case, habitation is facilitated, qualitatively improved, or in pathological cases, then obstructed or uh, inhibited. But I shy away from the term art because although I have no objection against uh, recognizing in architecture an artistic moment, artistic in the sense of fine art, it may in my mind lure one misguidedly to a number of modern ideas about art and artists that simply do not fit architectural practice. Its similarities and affinities with fine arts do not represent, in my mind, the essence of architectural practice. I imagine you would like to, me to discuss this. That will also have to wait for another time, but this is why you will see that I do not present architecture here from the point of view of aesthetics, for instance. Okay, now the term practices seem therefore a bit more suitable to describe architecture. Architecture is a set of practices which intervene in the processes of human habitation, says my definition. However, it is not the only practice, set of practices of this kind. Apart from the associated practices of urban planning, landscape architecture, and uh, the rest, uh, one should also think of other practices that mediate our uh, relation to the world as inhabitants thereof. You will see there, for instance, uh, uh, practices, cultural practices of welcoming. There you have uh, reference to religious practices. I don't know if you can see that there's a little box there at the entry of the door. It's a Jewish family gathered around the mezuzah. There it contains a, a small piece of scripture and it is uh, used to ceremoniously devote the house also to religious practice. And there you have uh, 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 children from Taiwan, I believe, uh, uh, welcoming each other in the world by simply playing together. All right. By the way, my photo is not uh, out of focus. Uh, if you ever go to Taiwan, you'll see that children are out of focus there. Um, <laughs> Um, consequently, if I use the term intervening, um, I necessarily use that in such a way to coordinate the primary, uh, let's say, anthropological level of human inhabitation of the world and the practices of architecture, so that architecture is a profession of responses to pre-existing processes, to events that are more ba basic and even uh, normatively more important than design. In short, in this presentation, my basic assumption, which is captured in the definition, is that what architecture is, can be, and can become, has to be understood in its constitutive dependency on the complex of events of habitation. Now let me move on to uh, framing this question. As we start to reflect on the agenda for architecture, as I was uh, commissioned to do, one of the possible approaches that comes to mind would be to explore the futurist question. So what do the typical human inhabitants of the world and of South Africa look like today, and what will they look like in the years to come? And what can one subsequently learn about the task of architecture from these basic indices? So one may, for instance, look up the indices and projections for population growth and life expectancy, percentage of population over the age of 65, or collect data on and projections on road density, form of urbanization, 
number of procedures to register property, number of mobile cellular subscriptions by 100 people, profile and access to medical services per sector of society, and so on and so forth. If you are interested in this, go to the website of the World Bank and you will find very quickly a list of 1,290 indices for South Africa, and if you are willing to pay a little bit, somebody will work out the projections for you on those too. Now, as impressive as the array of available statistics and projections may be, and even if the scientific credentials of these statistics and projections are entirely accepted, some of us may want to object. Is this not a false start? What are presented in these figures are either impersonal macro perspective measurements or median projections involving the needs and desires of the average person of a particular region. This means that whereas one is likely to encounter a number of people who come quite close to the image projected by each of these indices, it is quite possible that one will never even encounter a single person who corresponds to something like an aggregate image thereof, simply because we speak here about types. Are the clients of architects types? Certainly we architects are not animals of types. We are sensitive to the particularities of the environment. We are in touch with the genius Loki. We honor the will and whims of our clients. We respect the intricacies of the socio-cultural heritage of the stakeholders, and so on and so forth. Besides, is good architecture not a singular achievement of genius? An example inspiring other singular architectural projects, each in turn essentially the singular expression of the architect. Well, the conclusion to uh, my presentation of tonight will entail rejecting all of the simple yes or no answers to these questions as lamentably insufficient. The tension between the typical and the particular, between generalities and singularities, will accompany us throughout this presentation. Let us then approach the question from a different angle. So I move on to uh, part three of my presentation. Above, I've defined architecture with respect to the interference that the architect carries out in the lives of people and in the way they inhabit their world. From the many ways by which to access and clarify the relation between one human being or group, the architect or architectural firm, and another, the inhabitants of a place in the world, I would like to propose one that takes into account from the outset the mediatedness of this interference or interaction. In other words, if an architect is someone who interferes in the process of habitation of other people, I invite you to focus your attention on the fact that this interference is both a human interaction and necessarily one done by means of objects. Subsequently, studying architecture as a form of mediated interaction would require that one considers the human-human dimensions and the human artifact dimensions of this interaction at the same time. The manner in which I propose to do so is through the following hypotheses. Just as interpersonal relations cover the entire range from the intimate relations through various degrees of anonymity to complete anonymity, so human object relations could also be shown to cover the, the range between the extremes of intimate relations to anonymous relations. Okay, so I'll spend some time to explain what I mean by that. To do so, I use his partner, uh, social theorist Alfred Schutz, and in particular his sociological phenomenology of what he calls the dimensions of the social world. Schutz described how the variety of domains of the social world are formed according to the degrees of intimacy and anonymity that characterize our common interaction with other people. These degrees cover the whole range from the apparent directness 
of face-to-face -face relations with close friends and relatives, that is, where the other is encountered as a you, to all of the relations that shade away from that to types in degrees of abstraction or anonymity or generality. For instance, when we think about the citizen or the speaker of the English language, we all have informed or uninformed, sophisticated and unsophisticated, conscious and unconscious notions of the types by which these anonymous others are described. So, in the center of my presentation will be the idea of a type. But what now is this notion of a type and why is it so important? I would like to tell you a story of something that happened to me when I was a student. One night at about three o'clock, I was woken up by an immense noise in the block of flats where I lived. I heard people running upstairs and then knocking on doors and people yelling at each other. Slowly but surely, the volume increased until, unmistakably, I heard somebody uh, running up the flight of stairs, it was a wooden staircase, running up to my flat and then banged on the door. So I got up and opened the door and there he was. Black safety boots, black protecting set of trousers, a fireman's jacket, I think it was even marked, fire brigade. He had a fireman's hat on or a helmet on and around his neck was a gas mask. And then the guy yelled into my face, we are the fire brigade. So I thought that I should say to him, uh, oh, I thought you were Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning. But I didn't, and this is the point. Why didn't I do that? Because I was responding immediately to what I recognized as a type. I understood immediately what was going on, and what was going on was not just having an image of what was in front of me, but it sort of suggested to me what I had to do. That was to shut up and listen to the second sentence, which was, the building is on fire. Right. And thanks to that, I'm here to speak to you tonight. Okay. Now, this example helps us to understand the description of the social interactive significance of types. I summarize this um, with reference to um, uh, people working in the same tradition as Schutz, uh, Berger, and Lukman. Okay. First of all, what you gather from this uh, story, from types, or what you should gather is that others are dealt with through typifications. I typified the fireman, he typified me, by the way, as a typical citizen whose uh, feet are burning. And these typifications hold, that means they have social reality, they inform social interaction until modification is needed. Okay. Typifications involve a mirroring effect. Usually when we just simply act with other people, 